So it's, it's really an important component to show business, Fritz, is that you you need to record you need to record your I show. Know. Oh. All right, here we go. This is Media Path. I am Louise Palenker here with my co-host Fritz Coleman. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort of explore with this show what happens when you get obsessed with a topic and you can go online and then just keep going. And I think it began with the invention of the hyperlink, you know, our ability to just continue down a path at relentlessly until we've completely sated ourselves with the object of our desire or of our interest. Plays into the excessive nature of both of us, so it's good. Well, yeah. So uh, as long as sleep is not a priority, uh, mm -hmm. we're off and running. And today, we're going to talk about something that, that Fritz and I hold in common, which is a passion for the music of Motown. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on Motown according to the internet which is never wrong. Motown was founded by Barry Gordy Jr. as Tamala Records on January 12, 1959, and incorporated as Motown Record Corporation on April 14, 1960. Its name, a portmanteau of motor and town, has become a nickname for Detroit, where the label was originally headquartered. So uh, when began Hang your- Hang on, I have a throbbing in my portmanteau. Ouch, <laughs> those are so painful. Dr. Scholl's cushions can can be very effective. Take the pressure off the portmanting toe. Uh, Motown, Fritz, what began your obsession? Well, that's a great question. You know, I was born and raised in Philadelphia. So R&B music, the, the Philadelphia, the East Coast manifestation of Motown, and actually I think it started before Motown, was the Philadelphia sound by Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff. They had a recording studio called Sigma Sound, and it was called The Sound of Philadelphia. And it had groups like the Stylistics and the Delphonics and uh, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes and Teddy Pendergrass when he did his solo work. And even before that, I was brought up in an area, although I didn't participate in it myself, of street corner harmony, doo-wop music. And the start of doo-wop music was kids from the inner city area that couldn't afford instruments designed this type of four and five part harmony. And if you couldn't afford an instrument, you just made your voice sound like one. So you had to do, do, and do, do, and do all that. And so they would make their own uh, music. And so I, I was born up in that era. And even Wheezy on an, a more primal level, and I, I haven't been able to answer this question myself, I've always been attracted to rhythm and blues music, soul and blues, and I don't know why, because I have nothing culturally in common. I grew up in a lily white Republican cul-de-sac suburban area. I have nothing in common with the creators of this wonderful music, yet since I can remember, since I was in single digits, I can remember just being attracted, certainly to early Motown, but even before that, James Brown and the early the early uh, the contours and the vibrations and, and uh, the Isley Brothers, all that stuff has always been my favorite kind of music. And it's such an interesting question in my life as to why I relate to that more than any other kind of music. That was a well, long answer to your question, but I, I wanted to get it off my no, chest. But I love it because you're not alone and you represent a, a generation of, of people who were the, the post-war kids where corporations recognized uh, pretty quickly that you guys were maybe the first generation that had walking around money. And that kind of met of with the dawn of disc jockeys, or maybe one led to the other, but they're, you know, the recording- It was Top 40 Radio, uh, but you're exactly right. It was exactly right because Top 30, Top 40 Radio it, they, they used to have everything divided up into, there was uh, the cash box list of the 30 best-selling songs. Then they would have the list of race records. Then it became the R&B list. But when they put together the top 30 or top 40, it was a combination of the best-selling records of all genres. And that was brilliant because it exposed American youth to a little bit of all kinds of music. You'd have a country western song on there. You have Johnny Cash. Then you'd have a James Brown record. 
then you would have you know uh, uh, Johnny B. Good from Chuck Berry. All it was it was brilliant. I wish we had it now. Everything is so segmented now, but it exposed American kids and specifically American white kids to all this music. To up until that point in the fifties and sixties had been placed on what they call race music stations or black stations and mainly in the South. So this was an opportunity for kids to be exposed to this other music. And there's a great story and you and I are gonna talk about it on Hitsville USA, which is this wonderful documentary on, on cable where Smokey Robinson talks about the uh, Motown acts going on the road at the beginning of the Motown experience when there was a big rope line dividing the black and white audiences in their concerts. But after they'd been doing it for a couple of years and they were uh, gathering more power and they were able to insist that, no, we want our audiences to be integrated, they would take that rope down. And by the end of these Motown Act tours, everybody was intermingling. So it was, this music had a profound effect. So if we, if we take it a couple of uh, steps further back, you know, the beginning of re recording music is, is finite. It, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it feels like it, it, it's been there forever, like spoken word has been there forever since humans mm -hmm. can speak. But recorded music, the history is finite. So you start out with very scratchy sounding records, then you get into 78s that feel a little bit more polished. The microphone was only invented post Rudy Valley. So singers used to have to really project and then Frank Sinatra could sing gently into a microphone and his voice, you could feel the intimacy of it. So back in the 20s and 30s, white people were already obsessed with what was great sounding jazz music and they would flood to Harlem to go to clubs where black people weren't allowed to dine, but they were performing. So white people, all, we always knew what good was. When we heard it, we wanted to go there. We want, we sought more of it and, and we, we hunted for it and we wanted to consume it. But for some reason- That's a throughout, really good point. Yeah, but for some reason throughout time, it's been threatening to a certain uh, aspect of uh, the status quo yeah. that races are all human. And yeah. I and I want to get to that. I mean, it's a deeper. Uh, no, I think it's the most important aspect of Barry Gordy, and I know you and I have talked about this. Barry Gordy, because he knew how important presentation was, and a non-threatening packaging of these wonderful R and B acts would make it more accessible to white audiences. But in my own personal experience, I'll tell you the first forty-five record I ever bought was Elvis Presley. Hound Dog, and on the flip side was Love Me Tender. It was an RCA 45, and it scared the crap out of my parents. And then later on, I had uh, uh, the Contours and some of these bands, and it wasn't even that it was an African-American act. It was the sound and the rhythm, because this was the Lawrence Welk family. Right. This was Montevani music that made elevator music sound like hip hop. This was a boring family. So I sort of invaded their ears with this great R&B, but in on this new rhythmic music rode acceptance in the 50s during the civil rights movement. So I think this music permeated white households and made all the change acceptable. It did in my, in my, personal experience. And there probably was something initially primal and sexual about the sound of it that, that, oh, yeah. that parents found. Soul always sounded like sex to me. It sounded like the sex I wasn't having. So <laughs> I wanted to listen to it all the time. It but just, it, it, it is, it's very primal. And it goes back to African drums and, you know, two, two rhythms and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of percussion. That's exactly what it is. But if you talk about what you know, what are the um, underlying root causes of of racism, or what are the underlying uh, motivators of humans? And I think fear is is huge. I mean, I think love is more powerful than anything, but I think fear is huge. And one thing that I think uh, drives people towards racism is this fear that your child is going to meet and fall in love with somebody from oh, a yeah. different religion or from, 
And so I think this drives people to keep races apart. And so, you know, we wanted slaves to build, jumpstart our country so that we were immediately producing product that was trading on, on, on globally, but we didn't, we didn't want the repercussions of stealing people and enslaving them. We just kind of wanted to do that, but we didn't, we didn't want there to be any consequences. And what, what breaks my heart as much as slavery is, um, is, is the period after the Civil War where these people understood hard work, right? <laughs> because they were working very hard without getting paid. And so they immediately figured out how to become businessmen and how to um, create enterprise. And as soon as the white people in the town saw this happening, um, there were immediately political steps taken to um, yeah it's why reconstruction didn't work and then the jim crow era it's all that you know it looked good on paper but it didn't look good on paper to certain people yeah it was terrifying to certain people yeah that a black yeah. man would be as important in what i mean was it was you know the government it was abraham lincoln not johnson because johnson was as guilty of backsliding but it was uh u.s grant was trying to make reconstruction work but what i mean is it's people that had at the beginning of it good intentions of trying to absorb the south back into the american family but you're right but it, it's it all of this is fear everything we're experiencing right now is fear-based it's because essentially we're uh, afraid of cultures we can't identify with and thought processes that we can't identify with and it's all about fear and i think to the subject of uh, rhythm and blues music, the acceptance of it uh, did more for civil rights than most big speeches and most uh, laws because what it did was uh, make people excited about something from that area and consume it. And Barry Gordy was ahead of the group. You know, not only did he make, uh, you know, he had this great etiquette school to teach people to make themselves presentable to white audiences. He hired, his company was black and white employees. He took a lot of heat for that too. So he was walking the walk as well as taking money from this concept as well. Well, he understood what, what all uh, African-American entrepreneurs understood, which was that if you, in, if you uh, employ uh, African-Americans, then those African-Americans have money to put into the economy and to buy your product. So it was, it's pretty simple logic that you know, the best way to uh, have a strong economy is to employ people who have money and can spend it. And yeah. so Barry Gordy understood that it wasn't just that he wanted to uh, employ a lot of African-Americans, it was that he also understood it was good for business. Barry Gordy was uh, in his soul a, a businessman, mm -hmm. but he was fearless and he, he knew what he wanted and he was also musical. So he had that sort of magical combination of of skills that made him the right man for that for that moment. Motown, as we've come to know it, does not exist anymore. It appears to not be a label, but more of a label group now paired with Universal. We know that Barry Gordy sold Motown way back when, but at least then Motown was still a functioning entity. Now it's Motown in name only. And so I think that's interesting because a lot of people don't even realize realize that Motown lo no longer exists because it for us it it's it's a constant. Yeah, they've had an interesting history, and they tried to, or they signed some white bands that didn't work. They signed Rare Earth, Rare Earth with, uh, uh, you know, I just want to celebrate, any, or whatever that that the Rare Earth thing was. Mm -hmm. um, they had a couple of hits, and then they signed, I think, the first band that Neil Young was in, and I can't remember them. They were a Canadian band, but they never went anywhere. So they tried to sign white bands early, but I mean. If you look even beyond Barry Gordy, if you look at rhythm and blues in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, and, and its impact on uh, race relations, here's my personal example. When I was a senior in high school, I cut school with a friend of mine and went down to North Broad Street um, to the Uptown Theater, which was the Philadelphia version of the Apollo Theater, and saw James Brown in concert. And there were 1,500 people in this auditorium, and my friend and I were the only two white guys there. There was no problem at all. 
I was so cool. we were just all there for the same James Brown experience. But that that's like on a real tiny level, uh, what this what this music sort of did for that social period in America's history. I think. Yeah, I have a very similar memory. I, I'm 12 years old. If you can amer- imagine uh, parents today allowing this, I'm 12 years old. And the temptations are coming to Buffalo, New York, where I grew up. And I can distinctly remember that urgent feeling of knowing that if they came, I had, I needed to be there. I couldn't allow them to come and leave and me not witness it. It was some sort of urgency within me. And no one wanted to go with me. And uh, my dad dropped me off at Kleinhans Music Hall which you know, in, Buff- in Buffalo, New York, I- I'm this little blonde white girl with my Polaroid land camera around my neck. And I'm roaming up and down the aisles trying to take pictures. It was, you know, I just, I remember a guy came up to me and he's like, oh, you got to get much closer if you're going to get a good picture. And, and he's like, let me do it. And I handed him my camera. He took the picture and brought my camera back to me. It was just, that was... The mood that was the energy. The music brought people together. I, yeah. I mean, it was a hugely, from a sociological standpoint, hugely important. You know? And it's it's very it's very vividly stamped into my memory. The, those five men on that stage, and the, that energy yeah. and that that music. And then we recently went to see "Ain't Too Proud to Beg" on on Broadway. And I didn't see that. I, def- I definitely wanted to see. That. Oh, it's those guys work so hard mm-hmm. i i don't understand that's that's beyond a marathon every performance that those are the hardest working people i've ever seen in any broadway production but it's based on the book by otis williams which i have read and the name of the book is temptations and when you read the book and when you see this play you understand that it's not just the name of the band it's really what happens to young people who become very famous there are a lot of temptations. Especially people from the ghetto. I mean, these are all from the poorest parts of Detroit and their ability to accept fame and a lot of money. I mean, it was there was all kinds of tragic stories in the midst of all that. You're right. And well, what, several of them in the temptations. But one of, one of, one of the, the um, aspects of fame that I want to talk about, and it because it doesn't, it, it extends beyond Motown, but I think it's so psychologically fascinating is when you're the Temptations or the Supremes or the Beatles, say, for example, and you have a hit record at 18 or 20, it's similar to giving birth to a child because you are now forever the parents of this record. And no matter what else you do with your career, you are still bound by that. You got to play that in every concert for the rest of your career. And it's not just that you're you're the co-parents of this child. You're the co-parents very publicly. Yeah. People expect that song every time they see you whether you're Frankie Valli by yourself or whether, you know, you're one moody blue, you know, <laughs> <laughs> on a stage somewhere, you know, at, at age 90, which is bound to happen. Uh, you're just they would need if they don't hear Nights in White Satin, you know, you're not going to make it to your car alive. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, that's a lot of what happened to the Temptations. Is every one of them, except Otis, of course, it's his story. So you know, he you know he's the author of this story. But like the others, they all had individual problems that made it impossible for him to hold this group together because they were all sort of succumbing to. Because you know, you're. It's not only that you have a hit record and now you're. You're, you're bonded to certain individuals that you may not have ever gone into another business with. Yeah, there are five different people. Yeah. From different backgrounds. No, that's it. Every, you know, it really, to, to some extent, that happens to every band. Have you seen the new Robbie Robertson in the band documentary called We Were Brothers or Back no. Then We Were Brothers? Or It's on video on demand right now. It's, it's great. If you saw the last waltz, you know, it's Martin Scorsese directed this one too. Oh, okay. It's fantastic. And it talks about just what you're talking about. And, and you know, the, the, the weakest link, uh, 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 Robert is his name, Garcia, uh, the, the one guy who had the real bad drug problem that threw the whole band off the rails because everybody has their own little problems, but those little problems of one person affect this unit. And that's what happened with the Temptations, David Ruffin and his drugs, and there were other things too. So, 
It's and so, so and, and then what happens too is like then you do get married and then you do have children and now your career is you're not home. And so it just exponentially kind of aggravates uh, the complications of, of a person. You're not, I know Barry Gordy really tried to equip his artists with all the tools that they would need to be successful. But um, this is this is really tricky stuff. And it, in, if you've read Mary Wilson's book, Dream Girl, My Life is the Supreme, that's the most Shakespearean book I've ever read. It, I've worked with her at fundraisers. She's a lovely person and very humble. Yeah. She's great with kids. I, I mean, I, I like Mary. Very and good. what happened to her and Florence Ballard and Diana Ross is Shakespeare. It's just wow. this crazy story where just because of the way things shake down, Diana becomes the voice of the Supremes, you know, and according to Mary, she didn't have the best voice. She had a cute voice. She had a commercial voice, but Flo had this killer voice and little by little Flo is getting less and less to do on stage. And it was just eating her up. And yeah. She had had I think Diana Ross had the glamour factor. Plus, it sounds like Barry was in love with her even before he was in love with yeah. her. So he was kind of promoting yeah, her. Yeah, and Barry was in love with her. And so anytime, and, and Diana would do things like, you know, she, and like, look, they were kids. So you have to forgive everything I'm about to say because they were kids. But, uh, and she, you know, she worked it. She worked the whole Barry Gordy relationship thing. And so anytime something wasn't going right on the road, she'd call him and then there'd be an edict from on high that, you know, this was now in place and it was just squeezing Mary and Flo further and further diminished. But D Diana would say things to the girls like, oh yeah, tonight we're, we're wearing uh, the pink outfits. And then she'd go out there in a blue outfit. So that <laughs> It was again. It's, it's a unit, and and it's three different people with three different experiences and three different egos. Every band experiences that, and then they go through the breakup, and then they come back and say, "No, we're losing too much money. We'll just bite the bullet and make this happen." I think that's the Rolling Stones that don't talk to one another for 355 days a year, and then they do these concerts and make a bazillion dollars. Oh yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a business arrangement. It's a, it is a business arrangement, and and bands go into therapy together to work yeah. through this stuff. Yeah. You know, for example, it, one one thing you can do if if you're if you're wise enough early on is you can like name your band Bon Jovi. And then it's pretty clear <laughs> who the boss is. But yeah. is you know, yeah. Springsteen did something really interesting where he he would on the on the road he would he would bill them as Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, but on only rare occasions did the E Street Band get credit on an album. He wanted to be the owner, the author, the brand of Bruce Springsteen. And he knew that at a really young age, which a lot of artists don't. They just get, they just want to get signed and they just want a deal. And they'll, and then someone will say, you know, we really should call this Gloria Estefan and the Miami Summit. And even, and Gloria Estefan was like, no. Don't do that. And they insisted on it because she she was the dynamo. They just felt well, like that's exactly what happened with Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. OK, uh, Harold Melvin was not the lead singer. Teddy Prendergrass was the singer. Wow. So he was the Blue Notes. And what happened was uh, it, it's a total accident that one day Harold decided that Teddy was getting too much press. And to, you know, he was the sex symbol in the band and the beautiful voice. And so he decided it used to be just the Blue Notes. He made it Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes so he would get the credibility. And it was a huge mistake. It became a branding issue then, you know. Where's Harold Melvin? Well, he's not the singer. So. Yeah, it used to be like with Paul Revere and the Raiders. I'm like, well, where's Paul Revere? <laughs> oh, he's, yeah. he's you he's know, died, because. He died Mark, in 1776. No, but Mark Lindsay was the guy, you know, yeah. that everybody knew who that was. Right. So, yeah, it's group dynamics are. You could probably write a million. But another thing about what you were talking about, about um, the ego and the backstory of whoever the lead person is, that James Brown movie with, uh, what's his name? Was I can't remember the actor's name. He was so good. Did you see that movie called Get On Up? The James Brown story? I don't think I have. It was so good. I can't tell you. But it's all, and all these super successful guys, their obsession to succeed comes from this abject poverty. 
and these awful circumstances that they were raised in. He was raised in a log cabin by an abusive father and a prostitute mother in, in Georgia, in the hills of Georgia. And he left town, went to his grandmother's house. His grandmother was a madam in a brothel. I mean, just this hideous upbringing, but it, it, it was the forge that made his personality what it was and insisting on people calling him Mr. Brown and insisted on controlling his business all by himself and not letting anybody push him around because it was the only time in his life when he could control circumstances because as a child, he was a victim of these awful circumstances. I see. Just all those people. And again, it goes back to my original point when we started talking. I have nothing in common with any of these people. I grew up in a very safe, coddled environment. Why is it that I just love this music so much and it's a hugely important part of my life? It's really interesting. But that's the way all art is, I think. You know? Right. I mean, you, you know, you've got like white kids in America obsessed with Japanese anime or, or, or what have you. I mean, there's no, there, there's no explaining why we're drawn to something. It could be a past life or it could be just, yeah. it's just that it's good. So we, we were drawn to things that are, that appeal to us because of the quality. It's, it's just good. This is, this is good music. I mean, I wasn't just listening to the music of my time as a child. I was also devouring my parents' record collection, whereas most people weren't. So I was drawn to that as well as the pop music of, of my childhood. Well, so you were a more evolved child. I couldn't stand the music of my parents. My, my, my father would Saturday night would be, it would be uh, Lawrence Welk and Mitch, uh, what's his name? Mitch Miller. Mitch Miller, the sing-along thing, it was just No, I hate that. Awful. That's awful. I hate it that. It was an abomination. Well, I and don't... They, I, and I, if they wanted a little atmosphere of music for, for dinner, they'd put on like a Montevani record, which is the sound you hear after you die. When you're on your way to heaven, this is what's playing in your head. It was awful. So well, I, 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 part, of, part of my draw to the rhythmic, fun and funk and rawness of R&B probably was as a rebellion against my parents. Well, I, I agree with you. If my parents had been playing Mitch Miller and, and Lawrence Welk, I, I may have, may have been with you, but my, my parents had Sinatra and, and, and we had the Mills brothers. So the Mills brothers were, were originally billed as four boys and a guitar because they could make all those sounds of the entire orchestra with their mouths alone. And so this was really great stuff that that I, that I was kind of combing through, and I and I and I and I just love uh, the the standards. You know, I love all the Gershwin and Porter and and all, all of that music. So anybody that was interpreting that, I was I was all those in. spectacular harmonies and all that. It's it's so beautiful. You know? Yeah, I mean, even if you listen to the Andrews Sisters, not even if, but I mean, that's those are some really really intriguing harmonies. Very precise. They were unbelievable. I mean, these wonderful uh, four-part harmonies that were, they were immaculate, you know? Really, uh, no, I agree with you. So one of the things we need to talk about with, with uh, Motown is talk about, talk about Barry Gordy and who he was, because, you know, if you read, if you read Mary's book, she talks about how she feels like that, that the flow was left, left behind and she was abandoned you know, because Flo had, had a drinking problem. Uh, she winds up, um, you know, Barry Gordy would do this thing where he would buy you a house and a car. So people felt rich. You know, these are people- That was the whole theme of Cadillac Records, if you've seen that. Okay. It was so underhanded. He would do the same thing that okay. the Chess Brothers did with guys like Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf, where they never got any royalties from their records. They had no idea how many records they'd sold, but we'll make them feel good. We'll buy them a new cat. Here's a gold cat. You got a Cadillac now. Yeah. And they said, oh, my God, I got a Cadillac. In the meantime, they owed them $5 million in royalties. It was very underhanded. I'm sorry. That's yeah, it. so there was some stuff going on, and, you know, I don't know the details of it. I just know what I've read in these books and that because Flo Florence had had some early childhood trauma, she, she needed more support, she needed therapy, and she needed uh, guidance. And instead it was like, you know, we're gonna just cast Cindy Birdsong in your role. And, and so Florence dies, I think in her 40s, in poverty. And then there's this whole, the, the whole Motown family shows up at her funeral, including Diana Ross. And Mary just felt like, 
Diana wanted to speak at, at Flo's funeral and Mary just thought that that was like the height of hypocrisy. So it was, it was really um, fraught and uh, fascinating. And I'm sure every person who witnessed it has a different perspective on what happened to those three girls, but just fascinating stuff. And then if you read Smokey's book, which is called Inside My Life, you know, Smokey and Barry were best friends. And so Smokey was like the second in command and he felt he had a more um, architectural role at Motown. He and not like, only that, probably doesn't get the credit as one of the great Motown songwriters too. He wrote My Girl for the Temptations. Yeah. As, a, as an answer to My Guy by Mary Wells. Yeah. He wrote beautiful, beautiful music. And uh, you're right. And uh, that's why those two were together on uh, Hitsville. It was fun hearing them kibitz back and forth. So let's talk about the two, well, two of the documentaries that we love so much. One is uh, called uh, Standing in the Shadows of Motown. And it's kind of like the answer to the Wrecking Crew. It's like, this exactly. is the, these are the guys that laid down all these tracks. And in, in like a tiny, I'd love to visit this one day, but it's, it looks like it's just a tiny little. They studio. called it the pit. It was really, there was like 15 musicians in there. In a home, you know. I, I love that movie, and and they finally got their due. And I thought I, 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 it was so fascinating to me to hear the stories, uh, like James Jameson, who is another guy that had alcohol problems, the bassist. They would play these jazz rooms at night yeah. down somewhere in Detroit, just improvise a lick, come back the next day, use that improvised lick in a, in a Motown song, and it would become one of the most famous licks in soul music history just improvised the night before probably after too many cocktails at a jazz club i just wow. uh, it was fascinating wasn't it i mean i yeah. love that and like and then there's certain licks that you hear on 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 a multitude of songs like the, you know there's the there's a drum lick that goes and you yeah. know you just hear it and it's just like it's such an exciting lick and uh it just these guys really 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 laid down some some tracks that they have this imprint on on us that we don't even realize because you know you you hear something and you just you just know like you hear two notes and you know that's my girl or you know uh you, you just you just know in your soul what's a, what's about to happen and it just it just kicks in so hard and, and that's uh, another example of how uh, although you, you mentioned it before, jazz probably did this before rhythm and blues did, which was to bring, be multicultural in the talented guys. But they had white guys like Dennis Coffey, that, that uh, guitar player, in the Funk Brothers. And so they had white players in there, too, at a time when they probably couldn't go out and play together in a club because it'd be unheard of, but they could jam together because it was anonymous in the studio. And, and the same with, uh, you know, the same with... Um, Stax records and you know they had what's his name the lead guitar player who was white and the bassist uh, and and all those guys from muscle shoals it it, it really I, I don't know it, it it was like a cross-cultural deal well music is is integrated way before anything else before yeah. the armed services before any mm -hmm. kind of office setting but before yeah. i mean there there were integrated offices for example in in washington DC and then Woodrow Wilson comes in and he's like yeah no that, this can't happen on my watch uh, you know so there's been fits and starts you know all along where um, it feels like even just having a, you know an African-American president it feels like we're making progress and then the next thing is just like another another faction of society saying oh I don't think so and yeah. and it's just so it's so heartbreaking but music just keeps pumping along like you know no we're this music and sports really like no the best people are going to be the ones who are going to do this together that we want the best people it yeah. does not matter what color they are i love the funk brothers movie though i just love all those stories and yeah funk i love how it opens with that six, six guys and their instruments and one old DeSoto going through the cold michigan night to a gig and you know i don't know if those guys i don't even know if they mentioned it in the movies if those guys participated in any kind of royalties from all the sessions they played in, do they get alert? Does the musicians' union insist that they get paid royalties for all the things they played on, or they bought them? You know, they gave them a flat fee, and that was it. And nobody. I, think, it. I mean, that's like asking if the Wrecking Crew did. I don't think so. They are mm -hmm. they are paid for their session. That's what I yeah. think. That was it. 
Yeah. I, I, now, I, now, the I, one I, that's airing right now on, on Netflix is Hitsville, right? Yeah. And that's you. That's the one you've watched several times. I've watched it several times. I just love it. And uh, I love the stories where history changes. I don't know if it was Martha Reeves or it was uh, one of the ladies was the receptionist there. And they had somebody from uh, the union come in to inspect the place and they needed to have a woman singer or they had to do, do you remember that story? And, and, and she always wanted to be a singer. They said, well, Mary, yeah, come in here. And she gets up from behind her typewriter and goes in and stands at the microphone and starts singing just so this union rep would get a sense there was a woman in place there or something. And they said, wait a minute, we got to record this woman. She's really good. I forget who it was. Was it Martha Reeves or Mary Wells or one of those people? Well, I could Google that right now. Yeah. Okay. She was a receptionist at Motown and just was accidentally one day put in there to do a session. I think it's Martha Reed. And I love the stories of Stevie Wonder coming in there and scaring people. He was so talented because <laughs> he played like five instruments when he was 10 years old. And yeah. Wonderful stories. It's crazy good stuff. And, and, and Barry Gordy was very democratic. Uh, he would have a record and whoever produced it, you know, whether it was uh, Holland Dozier Holland or Norman Whitfield, they'd all come in there and they'd play their record and then all the employees would vote as to whether they thought it was a good record. And the first time they played My Girl, which was written and produced by Smokey for The Temptations, nobody liked it. They said, ah, it doesn't sound like a hit to me. <laughs> Turned out to be one of the biggest hits in the history of American music. Wow, I know, it's, it's, uh, it's so crazy. crazy. Just in, 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 watch that movie and you picture yourself there. You picture yourself like as a kid riding your bike over and sitting on the lawn and waiting for people to come in. And I know. Because that's what I would have done. But I mean, the Supremes, they, it took them a long time to get a hit record. And, uh, yeah, that was the thing. That was a good part of that movie. That it took them a long time. They kept saying, we've got to get a hit for the girls. Yeah. And they were asked to come in and do hand claps. Because yeah. Motown is big on hand claps. You could listen for them in, in the records. You'll hear it. Yeah. They, they're just so en energizing. And so she they, would sing, they would sing background for uh, you know the male groups like the Four Tops and the Temptations, but never could cut a hit on their own. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so I have some uh, trivia question for you. Oh, no. What was the first Motown hit? Martha Reeves and the Vangelis. It was uh, Please, Mr. Postman by the Marvelettes. Marvelettes, okay. And that's one of the most covered songs of all time. Yeah. Beatles covered that. Which is why we have to support the U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> Otherwise, future At the very least, it has to be. Future generations won't know what she's singing about. Like, what is she? What? She's dating the postman? What's a postman? Uh, all right. So I have some other... Uh, thought-provoking questions for you. Okay. How much do you feel that Barry, Barry Gordy and Motown contributed towards civil rights and improving race relations in America or around the world, really? Imposs impossible to quantify, I think huge. And I think in that movie when Smokey describes the change in the makeup of the audiences as their tours continued, they knew they were having an effect. Wow. Yeah. Right? Yeah, oh, and absolutely, kids, kids just like you. And uh, that music has a way of just kind of getting into your system and, and helping you understand that we're all humans. Is the sound we consider American music mostly originated by black musicians? I believe so. I believe American rock and roll is based in, root, in, in, in at blues. And of course, blues is a mishmash of uh, African rhythms and European folk rhythms and uh, all the bouillabaisse of interesting cultures down around the Mississippi Delta and rock and roll was born out of that and then uh, you know delivered by white artists like Carl Perkins and Elvis Presley and that kind of thing. Yeah and you, know, you have all you know all of this um, let's call it pasty folk music coming from Irish and and England and Scotland and you know all, what they used to do is they would um through the ages it wasn't considered lifting if you took a melody and wrote new lyrics to it that was just considered how songs traveled you know you'd know if you knew a melody and you wanted to write 
you felt inspired to write new poetry to it, you 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 would, and that's just how music was shared. It was it was a it was an oral memory of songs, yeah. and so yeah. you know you had a lot of hill people from a, a, a lot of different places, and they knew different melodies, and they'd write new lyrics to them, and you know this this becomes what's known as our what we call our folk music, but then you know you blend with that with some African influences and the banjo, yeah. and then you come up with country music. Yeah. You know, which is which is for for decades been mostly white music, but largely inspired by. Well, they call country the white man's blues. It's, okay. They, they deal with a, a lot of the same topics, but you're right. It's all they all sort of fed off of one another and influenced one another. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, the Ken Burns documentary uh, on country oh, music is man, that was so good. Just great. So good. Is Motown the first black-owned business with majority white customers? That's a really good question. Um, do you have the answer to that? No, I don't. I, I mean, that's we, a wonderful question. Because you know, there's it a. Might have been, he might have been the first guy to be brazen enough to think he could market his product to a white audience, because it just wasn't done back then. I don't think so. Maybe not out of fear, but they just didn't see the marketing possibilities. I think there were companies where the. It was can, it was kept secret that the CEO was an African American. I think there were companies where it was kept secret because they thought that it would scare off white audiences. And that you can white. just look at advertising. There were no African American people in, uh, in in broadcast advertising. Yeah, and it's like, do you don't you don't think that black people buy things? Why why do you not want this business? I think they just it, it was too early in our history for that to. But there's a documentary on Netflix that I have not yet watched, and I and I believe it's about Madam C. J. Walker, who was a an African American entrepreneur. Yes. In the early 1900s, she made beauty products mm -hmm. specifically for African American women. So that's something we can both watch and talk about in a future episode. Um, what is so threatening about black people doing well? Or, or here, for example, or Jewish people doing well in, in, in the Germany of the 1930s. Why are humans so clannish and so terrified of diversity and inclusion? That's a huge question. I, I think that it goes back to what we talked about earlier. It's the fear of the unknown. I'm not familiar with your culture, so your culture must be less than my culture. Um, uh, Blacks and Jews have a lot in common because they're both oppressed. Uh, and um, the, some of the brilliance of their accomplishments in both groups of people come from their desire to survive. And you know, they, they do really well when unoppressed. Yeah. But I mean, Jews, in order to, they've been oppressed by everybody on the globe. And they, they do well because they have an acumen for business. And all of it is born out of trying to survive the circumstances they were in. And I think that the African Americans in their accelerating in, in, in entertainment and sports, it kind of comes from that same thing. I don't like to paint anybody by the broad brush, but I'm just, I'm looking for similarities and oppressed people doing well and what they do well. You know, I think it's threatening to the status quo or the people in power if some other perceived group is, is, is gaining momentum. And so you want to, you know, you want to sort of form, it's like our inclination to form fraternities or something like the concept of a fraternity is that we're in and you're out. And yeah. so I, and I think what makes it even worse is when you have political parties or demagogues that need to have the other in order to make their political point. We're oh. seeing that now. You know what I mean? There has to a scapegoating, and, and the, it, it, they need to have a, a, a target. And so, um, you know, Hitler did it in the 30s, and in the South, they they. Uh, 
uh, did it with uh, black people after emancipation and they didn't want them to get power just like you're talking about they started to rise in power they got political power they were actually voted into office and that scared people that was the rise of the ku klux klan right. and then they were all tamped down again and right. we had the Jim crow era so it's all born out of fear of the other and as you say uh, accomplishing something like if they're successful, it's going to take away from your success. Right. It's it's it, it's a zero sum game. That this perception that it's a zero sum game. When of course it isn't, because as we talk talked about, you know, if you put money in someone's pocket, that person doesn't have money that you don't have. That person has money they're going to pump into your economy so that you're going to have more stores to visit in your little village that you enjoy going to. It's it's we're contributing towards a, a greater lifestyle for all of us. So, but but. Gaining power through fear is really interesting because rage isn't a primary fear or a rage isn't a primary emotion. Fear is the primary emotion. So, but if you make people fearful, you can quickly make them angry and then they, they, they devote their anger to some perceived threat and they don't look at what you're doing, which is now you own all the stores on main street and you, and you, you've played a hand in getting every Po local politician elected you're the person that's pulling all the strings in this town but no one's looking at you they're just looking at like oh i don't want that family moving here like that's the thing that's terrifying and it's what we do it's a it's it's listen it's it, the explanation is as simple as human nature we, we all hate what is we're very tribal we're seeing that now more than ever and we, we don't like what is not us. And we love to blame our own inadequacies uh, uh, in some perceived threat from another group. That's what Hitler did. He said everything that was wrong with Germany was uh, because of the Jews. Well, it wasn't. It was because at the end of World War I, Woodrow Wilson and the geniuses that decided to divvy up Europe and uh, the Middle East and made Africa. a very serious mistake. It was horrible. And then make them pay for their own defeat that was really a dumb thing to do. And that's what enraged the Germans. But the Jews, because they were right there, and it's easy to point to, uh, were an easy target for Hitler. And I'll tell you what, we see that right now. Not, not to that extreme. God, I hope we don't. But I, I, it makes me so hurt when I hear the way we're doing the same sort of psychology right now in many ways. Well, you know, you, you have Putin who's using Soviet tactics of psychology to, um, to fracture people, to find weak points and, and press on them. And so these are, these are human weak points. You know, we're clannish because uh, as a species, in order to survive, you had to worry about the clan on the other side of that hill with... Yeah. With, with foreheads that were a little bigger because they might come over here and take our food and our women. So you had to be a little afraid of people who look different. But, you know, as we're becoming uh, m more globally interdependent, and I know the word global can be, you know, a hot word for certain people, but, uh, but uh, you know, actually the internet and- But it's the truth. We're a global world now and some people can't get used to that. Yeah, and so there's, there's still gonna be those fear points that hit you where you, you look up and you say, oh, oh no, I, you know, I don't know what's happening. I don't understand this. Why does he have a turban? What does that mean? Uh, what, you know, wh what if my daughter falls in love with him? And then it, the, the, the most ironic thing too is that you know, I think I think these are deep-seated fears that your daughter is going to marry someone from a different clan. But um, conversely, the thing that melts racism the quickest is having a grandbaby uh, from that marriage. Yes, your, your heart melts instantly, and it. So the thing that they're most fearful of is actually the cure. That's a great point but a lot of people don't want to look at it that way because they're still thinking, well, my daughter's not marrying anyone who's not a Christian or not. No. So what you're saying is it goes back in the DNA history of human beings to yeah. be that way. Y exactly. It's, it's just them protecting their family and their tribe and their, yeah, it's human nature, but we've also evolved beyond that point and we have to, but there are too many people in the world now. We can't look that way. We, we have, but it, it, you know, and it's like, I, I get that, that, um, white privilege it, it is a thing and that you know walking around in white skin we have no idea what it's like 
to walk around in, in a different color of skin. But I know that even the, when, the, when it was just the Native Americans who were here, there were some tribes that were peaceful, and then there were some tribes that were always on the warpath. And, and, and like the Sioux or the Lakota, for example, that was what they did. Yeah. So people, those are people. They, they, they're just... People are going and they to... probably had to be that way because to protect themselves with whoever their enemies were at the time for survival. Who wants to get the buffalo down in this area? We have to. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's the same on on any continent. It's it's as you go as you go through the centuries, you're going to see all kinds of Huns invading or or Tartars yeah. or what have you, and it's just that's just what humans do. So now we just have to say, well, we're only on Earth for a hundred years each. So while we're here in our limited capacity to see beyond our village or beyond the time frame of our time on earth, you know, what can I do to move things forward? Yeah. And we can all do a little bit. I agree. And what you just said goes back to the beginning of this discussion. Uh, which was the social impact of uh, Motown and rhythm and blues music. And I think that that music and that, uh, and, and the way it was marketed to white America helped to soothe the chasm, you know, be between us and say, we're not so different from them. So I think that's the social impact that this music had. Absolutely. And what a gift. Yeah. It, it, it was, I think, as powerful as Mar Martin Luther King in, in moving us closer towards each other in understanding. And, and I'll tell you, I, 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 uh, I feel duplicitous sometimes because I, I don't like a lot of hip hop. I like the rhythm. I like the beats but I don't like the lyrics. And, and everybody says, well, no, it's the, it's the blues of the 21st century, but it's not. Blues um, lamented like their poverty and that stuff didn't go well, but there was always some humanity connected to it. It wasn't all violent. I, I mean, uh, uh, hip hop uh, is uh, denigrating to women. It's misogynist. It's all about money. And it's what happens if you gave a if you took a blues artist like Lead Belly and gave him ten million dollars, he'd probably write hip hop songs because it'd be all about you know the champagne and the and the cavassier and and the bitches and all that kind of stuff. I, I I just don't it doesn't resonate with me. I don't think it's the blues of the new century. I think it sometimes is the poetry of the street, I guess, but it's not the blues because blues was, uh, you know, it was howling at the moon. It, it was a lament. It was sad, but wonderful. And I think that's what resonated with me all the time. I don't know why I brought that up. I just thought. No, I, I, I understand. I, I understand the point. And I don't think that all hip hop lyrics are like that. No, they're not. I, I mean, if you, if you want to learn about hip hop, just watch Ari Melber because he- I, <laughs> I do. He's pretty he knowledgeable, man. He quotes these lines from these obscure hip-hop guys. I don't but know. You, how but you have to understand, even though it's not our favorite art form, if he's pulling wisdom from those lyrics, then there's wisdom in those lyrics. No, you're absolutely correct. And he's smarter than I am. So. Yeah. Well, Fritz, I really enjoyed this conversation. I always enjoy talking to you. We'll, we'll do it again. All right. I'll talk to you soon. We need to send a copy of this to Barry Hope and Barry Gordon. Oh, man. I would love, I would love to go to Motown with him and Smokey and sit behind that piano. Cool. All right, darling. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we don't have to hang up the Zoom call. That's just going to be the end of the show. Well, I have to because I have to do the weather. Oh, the weather. Yeah. And my job keeps getting in the way of my phone.